Yesu Abi Yasmanan. Tene Brahma Hidaya Adikavaye Muyantiat Suraya. Tejo Vari Madam Yatavini Mayoya Chatri Sagomesha. Tam Nasvina Sada Nirasta Kuhakam Satyam Pradam Di Mahi. O oh my Lord, Sri Krishna, Son of Vasudeva, O oh, all pervading personality of Godhead, for my respectful obeisances unto you. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth and the primeval cause of all causes of the creation, sustenance, and destruction of the manifested universe. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations. And he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahman. The original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations of water seen on fire or land seen on water. Only because of him do the material universes, temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of nature, appear factual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna, who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode, which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. Dharma Pojita Kaitrovo Cha Paramo Nirmatsaranam Satam Vedyam Vastava Matra Vastu Shivadam Tapa Trayon Moonam Shimad Bhagavate Mahamuni Krite Kimba Purir Ishwaraha Sadyohridi Avurudyate Tra Krite Bihisusubis Dakshana Completely rejecting all religious activities which are materially motivated. This Bhagavata Purana propounds the highest truth which is understandable by those devotees who are fully pure in heart. The highest truth is reality distinguished from illusion for the welfare of all. Such truth uproots the threefold miseries. This beautiful Bhagavatam compiled by the great sage Vyasadeva in his maturity is sufficient in itself for God realization. What is the need of any other scripture? <laughs> as soon as one attentively and submissively hears the message of Bhagavatam, by this culture of knowledge, the Supreme Lord is established within his heart. Nikama kalpaturur galitam falam sukamukad amrita dravya samyutam Pibata Bhagavatam Rasam Alayam Muhur Ahoraska Bhuvi Bhavukaha O expert and thoughtful men, relish Shimad Bhagavatam, the mature fruit of the desire tree of Vedic literatures. It emanated from the lips of Sri Sukadeva Goswami. Therefore, this fruit has become even more tasteful. Although its nectarian juice was already relishable for all, including liberated souls. Shinvatam Swakuta Krishna, Punya Shravana Kirtana, Vidyanta Stohya Badrani, Vidunati Shihit Satam.
to hear about Krishna from Vedic literatures or to hear, hear from him directly through the Bhagavad Gita is itself righteous activity. And for one who hears about Krishna, Lord Krishna who is dwelling in everyone's heart, acts as a best wishing friend and purifies a devotee who constantly engages in hearing of him. Nasta presu badresu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Sloke Bhakti Bhavati Naistaki In this way, a devotee naturally develops his dormant transcendental knowledge. As he hears more about Krishna from the Bhagavatam and from the devotees, he becomes fixed in the devotional service of the Lord. Tadarajas tamo bhava, kama loba dayas chayi, cheta etar enavidam, stifam satve prasiddhati. By development of devotional service, one becomes freed from the modes of passion and ignorance. And thus, material lusts and avarice are diminished. Evam prasana manaso bhagavat bhakti yogataha bhagavat tattva vijnanam muktasangasya jayate When these impurities are wiped away, the candidate remains steady in his position of pure goodness becomes enlivened by devotional service and understands the science of God perfectly. Thus Bhakti Yoga severs the hard knot of material affection and enables one to come at once to the stage of a samsayam samagram, understanding the supreme absolute truth personality of Godhead. Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 15, Verse number 42. Tritve hutva chapanchatvam Tach chai katve juhun muhuni Sarvam atmani ajuhavid Praman yatmanam avyaye Translation by Srila Prabhupada Kije. Thus annihilating the gross body of five elements into the three qualitative modes of nature, he merged them in one nescience and then absorbed that nescience in the self, Brahman, which is inexhaustible in all circumstances. Purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Srila Prabhupada. All that is manifested in the material world is the product of the Mahat Tattva Avyakta. And things that are visible in our material vision are nothing but combinations and permutations of such variegated material products. But the living entity is different from such material products. It is due to the living entity's forgetfulness of his eternal nature as eternal servitor of the Lord and his false conception of being a so-called Lord of the material nature 
that he is obliged to enter into the existence of false sense enjoyment. Thus, a concomitant generation of material energies is the principal cause of the minds being materially affected. Okay, so let's read that again. Thus, a concomitant, that means at the same time, generation of material energies is the principal cause of the minds being materially affected. Thus, gross body, thus the gross body of five elements is produced. Maharaj Yudhisthira reversed the action and merged the five elements of the body into three modes of material nature. The qualitative distinction of the body as being good, bad, or mediocre is extinguished, and again the qualitative manifestations become merged in the material energy, which is produced from a false sense of the pure living being. When one is thus inclined to become an associate of the Supreme Lord, the personality of Godhead in one of the innumerable planets of the spiritual sky, especially in Goloka Vrindavan, one has to think always that he is different from the material energy. He has nothing to do with it. And he has to realize himself as pure spirit, Brahman, qualitatively equal with the Supreme Brahman, Parameshvara. Maharaj Yudhisthira, after distributing his kingdom to Pradikshit and Vajra, did not think himself emperor of the world or head of the Kuru dynasty. This sense of freedom from material relations, as well as freedom from the material engagement of the gross and subtle enrichment, encirclement, makes one free to act as servitor of the Lord, even though one is in the material world. This stage is called Jivan Mukta stage, or the liberated stage, even in the material world. That is the process of ending material existence. One must not only think that he is Brahman, but he must act like Brahman. One who only thinks himself Brahman is an impersonalist, and one who acts like Brahman is the pure devotee. Shila Prabhupada Ki So we see from this verse and many other uh, purports that Prabhupada has written that without active engagement in devotional service, whatever one has accomplished before that is more or less useless. Shrama Heva Kevalam. Why? Because there's no difference between devotional service in this world and devotional service in the spiritual world, if it's pure, without any material motive uh, other than to please the Lord. So, uh, one gets a sense of freedom from material relationships, as well as freedom from the material engagement to the gross and subtle uh, encirclement. So when it says, in, why does he use the word encirclement? In other places he says that everything we see is a combination of matter and spirit in this world. But actually, <laughs> in a letter and other places, and like here, uh, there's not really a combination of matter and spirit. It's just like oil and water. They don't mix, really. They might be together, but they don't mix. In the same way, the soul never mixes with matter, never becomes chemically bonded to matter. However, this word encirclement is properly used. The soul becomes covered with matter. Just like if you drop your gold ring in, on the ground, eventually it'll be covered by grass and dirt. You won't see it anymore. And, but it's never chemically bonded with the ground. So if you get a metal detector and you go around, eventually, uh, because it, it's just covered by grass and earth, you'll be able to find it. And then you just wash it off, or wash the dirt off, get the grass off of it, and put it back on your finger. It's pure. 
it, it never really became contaminated. By the way, I don't, I don't think it ever rusts either. Just like we have gold, uh, 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 what do you call that? Uh, we have gold uh, leaf on, on the altar. It never really loses its color, like silver. Silver eventually loses its color, and, become, and then you have to polish it. The gold never, when it's pure gold, it never loses its shine or its uh, luster. <clears throat> In the same way, the soul is never contaminated by material nature. It's simply covered by it. It's never chemically bonded. It's simply covered. Therefore, it's possible uh, to uh, reveal the spiritual nature of the soul as it's possible also to reveal the spiritual nature of matter. Matter is not uh, something temporary. It's eternal also. It, matter and spirit were both existing before the creation. And they'll exist after the annihilation also. So, uh, therefore, but the body that we get is, is, is a expansion of the mind. And we read that earlier also, and Prabhupada is repeating it over and over again. Uh, he says, Thus the gross body of five elements, it says, Thus a concomitant generation of material energies is the principal cause of the minds being materially affected. Thus the gross body of five elements is produced. So previously, in another purport, Prabhupada said, uh, let's see. Well, previously he said that the body is uh, extended or, or, or produced by the mind, the mind being affected by uh, the desire to dominate material nature and exploit it. So, therefore, if we... Okay, and so here it says... Uh, it is really foolishness to engage oneself all the days of one's life in material enjoyment and fruit of activities, because as long as the mind remains absorbed in fruit of work for material enjoyment, there is no chance of getting out of the conditioned life or material bondage. No one should follow the suicidal policy of neglecting one's supreme task of attaining the highest perfection of life, naming going back to Godhead, back, going back home, back to Godhead. So. As long as our mind is focused on material uh, acquisitions and material enjoyment, we keep generating new, uh, more and more material bodies uh, according to the, our desire. That's why it says, man proposes, God disposes. In other words, if we have these desires for sense gratification, then Krishna will eventually uh, satisfy those desires. Now, the question was asked, uh, uh, two days ago, uh, one of the devotees said, uh, "Why would Krishna satisfy the material desires, knowing well that that uh, one is going to get entangled and suffer in material nature?" Right? It's a good question. This is explained in the fifth chapter, fifteenth verse, which is a wonderful explanation by Prabhupada, and, and he says, "Not to take us chitit papam." The Chaiva Sukitam Vibhu Agne Agne Agna Nena Vritam Gyanam Tena Muyanti Jantava. Nor does the Supreme Lord assume anyone's sinful or pious activities. Embodied beings, however, are bewildered because of the ignorance which covers their real knowledge. So Krishna is not responsible for our suffering, although he will facilitate us if we have material desires and insist on them. In other words, if the mind keeps focusing on material desires, then eventually Krishna throws his hands up and says, okay, I give up. You can have what you want. 
So this is explained. It says, the Lord is omnipotent, but the living entity is not. The Lord is vibhu, or omniscient, but the living entity is anu, or atomic. Because he is a living soul, he has the capacity to desire by his free will. Now, even though Krishna is the controller of spiritual and material energy, and therefore there's no question of independence. None of us are independent. However, if we insist on meditating on sense gratification, Krishna will facilitate that. But we're still controlled. We're still under the control of the Lord. But he'll, give a, uh, he'll help us achieve our material goals, just like he'll also help us achieve our spiritual goals if we focus on it. So he says, because the living soul has a capacity to desire by his free will, such desires fulfilled only by the om omnipotent Lord. And so, when the living entity is bewildered in his desires, the Lord allows him to fulfill those desires. But the Lord is never responsible for the actions and reactions of the particular situation, which may be desired. Being in a bewildered condition, therefore, the embodied soul identifies himself with the circumstantial material body and becomes subjected to the temporary misery and happiness of life. The Lord is the constant companion of the living entity as Paramatma, or the super soul, and therefore he can understand the desires of the individual soul as one can smell the flavor of a flower by being near it. Desire is a subtle form of conditioning for the living entity. The Lord, Lord fulfills his desires as he, meaning the living entity deserves. Man proposes and God disposes. So everything depends on what's going on in the mind. If the mind is focusing on material pleasures, eventually Krishna says, okay, you want that, you're going to get it. But he doesn't, he just gives you the facility. He sets up a situation where if you want to uh, do some nonsense, you can do it. He doesn't force you to do it, but in a sense you force him because you keep meditating on it. So when people say, you know, transcendental meditation, well, what is real transcendental meditation? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. You're, trans you're, you're transcendentally meditating on Please, Srimati Radharani, and please, uh, Lord Krishna, uh, always protect me so I can remain your servant. That's transcendental meditation. That's the real transcendental, not the phony transcendental meditation. Uh, it's, you know, I'm going to fly through the sky. Right? That's, that's, not, that's not meditation. It's like, you know, uh, my yogi was charging people $35 to teach them how to levitate, right? Now, how did they do that? They had a, they had a uh, cushion like this, a big, soft, uh, uh, cushy cushion. And then they would, they would sit in the lotus position, and then they go like this, right? And then and they might go up a little bit, right? And then people say, see, he's meditating, right? He's, he's levitating, right? The whole thing is not, and they take a picture when the person jumped up a little bit, and they were maybe like two inches off the, the cushion. And there's a picture of that as publicity of uh, transcendental meditation by which you can levitate. The whole thing is nonsense. It's all set up. It's all cheating. It's only a way to make money. But yet, people love to be cheated. They love it. They love to accept something false and imagine that they're going to levitate through the sky, you know. So, Krishna says here, desire, uh, Prabhupada says, desire is a subtle form of conditioning for the living entity. The Lord fulfills his desire as he deserves. Man proposes and God disposes. The individual is not, therefore, omnipotent in fulfilling his desires. Yes, yeah, so if you want to have sense gratification, you need to have Krishna's help. How does he help you? He gives you forgetfulness. That's why he says, Sarvasya chaham hridi sanivisto 
Matak smriti jnanam apohanam. So apohanam means he helps you forget Krishna. He helps you forget the regulative principles. He helps you forget everything. Like one time I was with an Iskand Sanyasi in Paris, and we were walk walking by a French confiserie. Confiserie means a French pastry shop. And they're very attractive. You know, everything is clean. And you look in the window and you see all these beautiful pastries. They're very decorative, very uh, creative. And he stopped and looked at it. And he said, can you hold my dunda a minute? I said, okay. So, you know, I'm holding his dunda. He walks into the shop and he buys some pastries. <laughs> and he comes out and he's already eating one. I, I said, Maharaj, I said, the, you know, they use eggs. He said, oh, really? Well, that's okay. My God, I, I couldn't believe he said that. <laughs> uh, but see, and, and Maharaj later on left the Danda and blooped from Iskand. Right. So you see that the attraction of the material world, there's a little glitter to it. It looks shiny. Just like when you're in an airplane and you pick up one of the magazines that's in the back of the seat in front of you. And it's, it's real shiny. You know, and, and people have, you know, nice teeth and nice hair and, and nice clothes. And they're shining. And, and there's an article, go to Montreal and be happy, you know. And there's a, there's a picture of a bar. And everything is shiny in the bar and all these bottles and, and nice glasses. And everyone's smiling, you know. And you think, wow, that's so attractive. Maybe I should go there to be happy, right? It's all nonsense. It's all Maya, you see. And that's, that's the way Maya catches us. She makes something shiny, just like the spider makes a web. And it's a geometrical, uh, beautiful light force, a light, 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 the attraction, especially in the sun. If the sun's shining on the web, it looks very beautiful and it's, and, and it's shiny. And the fly is going zzz, 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 and sees this uh, shiny geograph ge uh, uh, geometric construction and it says, zzz, that's really nice. You know? So it goes zzz, 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 and lands on the spider web. And it says, ah, oh, it feels so good being here, the warm sun and this beautiful light show. And it's real, the, the fly is really happy, you know. And after a while, it says, ah, I'm getting tired of this. Maybe I'll go somewhere else. So it goes, <laughs> See, now, that, that, that web is made with the saliva of the uh, spider, and the saliva is very sticky. And of course, the fly is, has these real thin legs, and it, and it gets stuck on that stickiness. And it goes, and keeps trying and trying, and, and the web is going back and forth like that, but it can't get free. And finally, it's exhausted. It's trying to catch its breath. And then the spider, who is hiding, now comes out of hiding and starts stepping on the web. And the web, every time it does that, the web uh, starts uh, shaking like that. And the, and, the, and the fly sees it and goes, this is, this is, this is, this is, trying to get away, but it can't. And slowly, the, I mean, it's, I, I saw this once, and I, it was frightening. The spider comes very slowly. It doesn't come fast. And each step makes the, the whole thing shake, you know, until it's standing right on top of the fly. And then its tail, and uh, just like an airplane, you know, you have those in the, the wings, you know, you have those uh, things that go down a little bit to control the airflow. So it, its tail comes down a little bit, and a very sharp knife-like thing uh, comes out of the tail, and it slowly gets it position right onto the fly. And the fly is saying this. The fly is going, zzz, zzz, trying to get out, you know, but it can't. And eventually it, it forces that uh, pin-like thing into the fly. 
and kills it. The whole thing is a horror show, right? And it all, so this is what Maya does. Maya makes this beautiful construction, like a skyscraper or an airplane or a Tesla or whatever. And it, it's shiny and it's beautiful and it looks wonderful. And we think, ah, I need that for my happiness. We get caught. And then Maya stings us, right? So we have to take very careful note of, uh, you know, the Shastric evidence. So, so here it says, uh, it says, the Lord, however, can fulfill all desires, and the Lord being neutral to everyone does not interfere with the desires of a minute, independent living entities. Doesn't interfere with them. However, when one desires Krishna, the Lord takes special care and encourages one to desire in such a way that one can attain to him and be eternally happy. The Vedic hymns therefore declare, the Lord engages the living entity in pious activities so that he may be elevated. The Lord engages him in impious activities so that he may go to hell. This is the Koshi Taki Upanishad 3.8. And then another verse says, the living entity is completely dependent in his distress and happiness. By the will of the Supreme, he can go to heaven or hell as a cloud is driven by the air. Then Prabhupada writes, Therefore, the embodied soul, by his immemorial desire to avoid Krishna consciousness, causes his own bewilderment. Consequently, although he is constitutionally eternal, blissful, and cognizant, due to the littleness of his existence, he forgets his constitutional position of service to the Lord and is thus entrapped by nations or ignorance. And under the spell of ignorance, the living entity claims that the Lord is responsible for his conditional existence. All his fault. The Vedanta Sutra 2134 also confirms this. Vaishamya nergenye na sapekshatvat tata hi darshayati. The Lord neither hates nor likes anyone, though he appears to. So, <laughs> this uh, man proposes, Lord, uh, the Lord or God disposes, people don't understand what it means. It means that whatever is going on in the mind, if we are meditating on sense gratification day and night, even though we're chanting Hare Krishna, sometimes people say, I'm chanting Prabhu, but my mind keeps wandering. Okay, where is it wandering? Right? It's usually wandering towards sense gratification, even though one is chanting. See? So what should you do when the mind starts wandering while you're chanting? Well, instead of going like this, Oh, Disneyland, I like to go. Well, if you chant like that, the mind is going to wander. But if you go, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. It's hard for the mind to wander when you're chanting proactively. You don't have to, sometimes, sometimes people when they chant, they look like they're suffering. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. That's not, suffering. That's not chanting. But if you chant louder, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Rama Hare Hare. You chase away those thoughts. And you get more focused because if you chant at a certain rhythm, just like one lady was telling me, oh, Prabhu, you know, I'm having trouble doing s services. I said, why? I said, well, you know, I have to chant my rounds. I said, well, how does that stop you from doing service? Well, it takes me three hours to chant my rounds. So what, what can I do to, uh, to be, have the energy to do my service? I said, well, first of all, you should chant faster. You're not chanting fast enough. It shouldn't take three hours to chant your rounds. It shouldn't take, at the most, one and a half hours, but actually even less than that if you chant with complete concentration. She said, okay, I'm going to try that. And the next week she came, she said, probably that solved my problem. I have plenty of time now to do service. I'm chanting quicker, and it doesn't take me three hours anymore. You know? So you see... Uh, it's very easy 
to be tricked into doing the wrong thing. And how, how come our mind can trick us into doing the wrong thing? Prabhupada explains that. He says, by not following strictly the four regulations, four regulative principles, the mind will play tricks on you. That's the point. By not strictly following the regulative principles, our mind will play, play tricks on us and we'll make mistakes and we think the mistake is right. And eventually, we leave Krishna consciousness. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Go to Premanandi Haribo. Are there any questions? Uh, one second. I can't. I can't understand what you're saying with your mask on. Yeah. Go ahead. Say it again. Yeah. This is important because unless we come to the level of devotional service, anything we have done. I, I explained it during the class. Anything we've done before that is actually a waste of time. Shama Evahi Kevalam. Unless we come to the conclusion that my real constitutional position is servant of Krishna, and I, in order to be a servant of Krishna, I have to be actively involved in service 24 hours a day. Sleep is even, can be actively involved in service because you sleep minimal in order to have maximum time. See? So, Unless you come to that conclusion and actually act consistently in devotional service, uh, everything you've done before that is a waste of time. It was a waste of time and energy. You know, all the pujas, all the parikramas, all the bhakti shastris, all this thing, all that. Thing. It's actually a waste of time unless you actually are fully engaged in devotional service. That's why it says the impersonalist. They think himself Brahman, but one who acts like Brahman is the pure devotee. So what do impersonalists do? They give up devotional service. And there's no devotional service in the Brahma Jyoti. That's why it's considered hell by, by devotees. Going to the Brahma Jyoti is going to hell for a devotee because there's no devotional service. Although it's exalted position. But there's no devotion. It's the only place. There is devotional service in the material world. There's devotional service even in hell in the material world. But there's only one place where there's no devotional service. That's the Brahma Jyoti. So it's considered already a fallen position, even though it's so exalted. There is devotional service in Vaikuntha and Goloka. There's devotional service in the middle planets, the higher planets, and even in hell. But there's no devotional service in Brahman, effulgence. See? So therefore it says, the uh, one who only thinks himself Brahman is an impersonalist, and one who acts like Brahman is the pure devotee. Haribo. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Yes. What? Okay. Brahmakund, is he here? Where is he? Yeah, there, there he is. You get the garland for your birthday, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. May you be blessed always to serve Krishna. That's the curse on you. You're always going to serve Krishna. <laughs> It's not a curse, it's a blessing. <laughs> All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Yes. I understand that everything uh, done before you are fully absorbed in the words of Strama Eva Kedon. It doesn't produce good effects like beauty, piety. Well, it might, but. Well, let's, let's, no, wait a minute. Let's analyze this statement. Mm -hmm. If you don't engage in full devotional service, mm -hmm. then everything you've done before that is a waste of time. That is my question then. What does it mean, waste of time? Because you didn't come to the goal. It's just like you're trying to, uh, just like, uh, 
the rabbit and the turtle. They're both in a race. So the rabbit obviously is running much faster than the turtle. But the rabbit gets a little bit of, uh, lazy and says, ah, well, you know, I'm, I'll just take a little bit of rest because the turtle goes so slow, you know. But the rabbit falls asleep and the turtle wins the race. So the turtle was focused on the goal, but the rabbit wasn't. So the rabbit lost, turtle won. Could we put that in a different way? Because Bhagavatam says, one would have a second. All these material activities for when to engage in the uh, highest of devotional service. He might not succeed, but it's not lost for him. But one who is completely, fully, properly engaged in material activities gets nothing. He, gain, he, gain, he gains nothing. Mm -hmm. So that statement, and so Bhagavad said, there's so powerful. There's never any loss or diminution on this path of devotional service. Yeah, okay, but he didn't get the goal in that lifetime. But he gained something. Yeah, he gained something. There's no guarantee that he's, he's going to uh, succeed even in the next lifetime. See, if you made the mistake of uh, not, not engaging in devotional service, not full time, you can make the mistake over and over again. There's no guarantee. Now, the fact that you have some uh, sukriti, okay, you'll start from the point where you left off in the next life. But, again, there's no, no guarantee. If, if someone can fall down, like, uh, uh, from, the, from uh, uh, Bhava state, you know, that's right before Prema. Yes. So th there's no absolute guarantee you, you, he, you can fall down again in the next life and the next life. So, therefore, uh, basically, there's, they're not taking advantage of the Sukriti. Uh, I'll give you an example. Of, uh, like, for example, um, one time there was a man that was very poor, and Lord Shiva and Parvati were were passing by where this man was, and he was begging, and he looked miserable and very poor. And Parvati said, uh, why don't you give him something? Lord Shiva said, well, I don't think he'll take it. He says, what do you mean he won't take it? And he's begging. He said, okay, well, let's see. So Lord Shiva put uh, a bunch of, uh, with his mystical power, a bunch of uh, gold and jewels in a watermelon. And the watermelon looked a little lopsided. Right? So he walks by the man, and the man said, Please, Baisab, Asirbat, Baisab. So he said, Okay, my friend. So he gives him the watermelon and, and, and puts the watermelon in his hand. And, you know, it's a little bit lopsided like that. And he goes like this said, I don't want a watermelon. I want money. And Lord Shiva said, well, I'm, I mean, he's, he's like a Brahmin, right? He said, well, I, I, I don't have any money to give you. Said, Why are you giving me this? I don't need this thing. It's, there's something wrong with it anyway. So Lord Shiva just walks away. So the next person walks by, he said, Bye, sir. So the man says, uh, uh, okay. he said, I don't have anything to give you. He said, no, no, take this and just give me something. So he hands him the watermelon. So he said, okay. So he gives him two paisa, and he walks away. And Lord Shiva looks at Parvati and says, see, I told you. Even if you offer him, he might not take it because he's, he's actually a false, uh, let's say, 
uh, he's falsely asking for charity. Charity should only, only should be given to to uh, saintly people. This person is is a businessman, but his his business is pretending to be suffering in order to get free money. You see, and and he, he's not interested in watermelons or food. He's interested in the money. That's why Lord Shiva said, "I don't think he'll accept it." Now, the person who gave him two paisa and took away the watermelon, he accepted the watermelon. <laughs> and when he opened it up, it's full of gold and, and jewels. You see. So not everybody is capable of accepting the result of the sukriti. Even though it's there. Even though they're going to start from the point they ended last life. But, but that attraction to material sense gratification is very, very powerful. Okay, we'll stop right there. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Yeah.